Um, we are continuing, as I mentioned at the forefront, a series. This is week two of seven weeks exploring our Wesleyan roots. Uh, Cammie and I are doing a preach and teach combination each Sunday. Uh, today, my title is Our Baptismal Covenant Lived Out. Uh, she taught on that a little bit uh, in the last Sunday school hour. It's open to all uh, who want to be part of that. We had 65 people in there this morning. I do a real short uh, version of this in my Methodism 101 class, uh, which will meet right after this worship service down in uh, A116. Lunch is provided if you're curious to learn more uh, about what Methodism uniquely is about. Uh, I'll be covering that over the course of about an hour and a half. Uh, you are welcomed. Let's bow as we pray. Dear and gracious God, we thank you for your grace, which bombards us moment by moment. Forgive us when we lose sight of that and forget to thank you. Our life is gift and it's given for a reason. Uh, may we learn and may we live into that reason together today, tomorrow, and always in Jesus' name. Amen. The church fathers and mothers who developed the liturgical calendar, that is to say, the Christian year, which you'll remember for us starts on that first Sunday of Advent, usually the last Sunday of November. Uh, when they designed this for both Protestant churches and the Catholic church, um, they didn't intend the linkage that we now experience within our Protestant church, but they could have and they probably would have. And the linkage is this, last Sunday, we remembered our baptism and we remembered the baptism of Jesus by his cousin, John the Baptist. And we came forward and we had an opportunity to remember our baptism or remember the fact that we were baptized as babies. We touched the water, we made the sign of the cross, maybe on our forehead, maybe on our wrist. Maybe we just rubbed our hands with thanksgiving. Several knelt and prayed to remind and be grateful for the grace poured into their lives at their birth and remembered at their baptism. That was last Sunday. The linkage is that this Sunday always is the Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. And to link both our baptism to the legacy of King absolutely is yin and yang. They are so very complementary uh, because it was Martin Luther King who consistently referred to the church. Remember, Dr. King was a Baptist minister first. He always referred to the church as the beloved community, echoing the words of God. When Jesus was baptized, you remember the story, the heavens open up and something like a dove comes down and rests on Jesus and the words from heaven come, this is my beloved son with whom I am so well pleased. Every time a child, every time a youth, every time an adult is baptized, we don't hear the words probably, but the words are surely said. This is my beloved daughter. This is my beloved son with whom I am so very pleased. And in between these two points of the Christian year, remembering our baptism, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, is this gospel reading that ties these two together. While probably not the intention of the Christian year liturgical writers, it certainly could have been. From Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, beginning in the 16th verse, come these familiar words. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Sidebar, permission to bring our doubts, permission to bring our disappointments, permission to bring our frustrations to God to Christ. Jesus told them where, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near, spoke to them. I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them 
in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all, everything that I've commanded you. And look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age, which is to say that Jesus will return. We just don't know when. What had begun with baptism for Jesus and all new believers was now moving forward. Baptism was just the starting point. Moving forward to go and baptize others, moving forward to teach others, moving forward to making disciples of others, teaching, baptizing, discipling. You English teachers would know that this is a present participle. It is a verb that is ongoing. It does not stop. It is continuous with no end in sight. This is the nature of the baptized life. This is the nature of the Christian life. And not just disciple making of people in my circle, but discipling people of all ages, all nations, all races, all socioeconomic backgrounds, everywhere until Jesus comes again. This is his promise. And this is the very last thing that Matthew writes in his gospel. And any of you who are writers know, you make your most important point in the last paragraph. You wrap it all up. This is the send off. If you remember nothing else, you remember this. This is what Matthew has the church to remember at the end of his gospel. We go and we baptize. We go and we teach. We go and we make disciples. And that it is an ongoing process, not a one and done moment in time. I'm not sure many parents have that understanding in mind when they call the church office and ask, we have a Sunday we'd like to baptize our baby. What, what might be convenient? We're getting the family in. We're going to have a big party. Uh, could we do it on this Sunday? In those moments, it's about the moment. And it's about the celebration. And rightfully so. Because when we baptize a baby, when we baptize an adult, there are three participants in this covenant making. The first is God, who delivers all grace and bestows love upon this child. Grace that is unearned, cannot be merited. It is simply something that is given and received faithfully by the parents, by the congregation. One of the covenant makers is God. The second covenant maker are the parents on behalf of their baby, on behalf of their child, making vows for this ongoing disciple making. And the third party, of course, is us. And it's why when I do a baptism, I make a big deal of walking the child purposefully around the congregation, getting her or him up close and getting everybody smiling to give a sense of ownership that this is our child now and that we have made a covenant to teach this child the contents of the Old and New Testaments, to surround this child in steadfast love of the beloved community, and to teach this child and to stand by her to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Why? Because it's what Jesus commanded, and it's what he told us to keep teaching after we have baptized. It's a present participle thing. It's an ongoing thing. In baptism, Christ makes a mark on each of us so that we can each make a mark on the world. That mark, of course, is grace. Like a baby receiving the love, we offer her. We cannot buy it. We can only pass it on. This baptism is... Uh, I think well expressed by a pastor at Pine Cove Church in Boulder, Colorado. Andrew Doherty says this. This baptism in social witness and change is a Dr. King kind of Christianity. Now, Dr. King was a Baptist minister first and foremost, but I'd be fast to say this is also a Methodist kind of Christianity of living into our baptism. It is a kind of Christianity that calls us to a gutsy gospel, Andrew writes, a sometimes dangerous business. 
King's life reminds us that baptism is not just a sweet, sentimental ritual. Baptism, Andrew says, in its fullest depths means taking a plunge with Jesus toward all sorts of delight and joy, chaos and social and political craziness and zaniness and uncertainty, and then facing all of it with Christ-like courage. Christ-like courage that shines light in the darkness and spreads salt in the places where favor and savor have lost their taste. Spreading what is good, spreading what is right and respectable and noble and true and just and fair. This, I believe, is what Jesus meant when he said, make disciples, teaching them all that I have commanded you. We don't have to look far for the kind of struggles that are in our world that need salt, that need light, that need grace, that the church uniquely brings. In a sin-sick world, the unacceptable hate crimes and vandalism against Jewish, Muslim, Asian, and black children of God is as near to us as the suburbs in which we live. When we remembered our baptisms last Sunday, we remembered the grace, yes, but we also remembered the call to be gracious, to be standard bearers of grace, goodness, and righteousness and to resist evil, injustice, and oppression, whatever forms they present themselves. That is not a one and done proposition. It is not just a mention. It is a year-round mandate as followers of Jesus. That's why Jesus called his church to make disciples, baptizing them, yes, but also teaching them. Teaching them that Jesus, what Jesus commanded them for all people in all places, until the end of the earth and until Jesus returns. I've seen no less than three examples in our own United Methodist Church in just the last week. I'm very proud that one of our own longtime members, Mary Alice Garza, will be honored tonight at the McKinney Performing Arts Center. She is being honored with a legacy award in the name of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for the tireless work that Mary Alice does with the Plano Multicultural Council, where she rallies and gets to know and brings together persons of different cultures, different religions, together for conversation and common bond that is too seldom found in our culture. She breaks down the silos of difference and finds the common ground of sameness, the sameness of grace, the sameness of invitation, the sameness of goodwill and goodwill making, bringing together all of God's children in ways as Jesus intended it. Secondly, I have seen the mark of discipleship lived out, of our baptisms lived out, and the number of new families who are coming to our church for the very first time in this new year, who understand that a child learns his faith by what they see modeled by their parents. Children always learn, finally, what they live within their family, not what they are told. They understand these parents that being not only baptized in your life, but living into that baptism together as a family within the church is the kind of discipleship that Jesus talks about and what the church has historically practiced. My third example was just yesterday. I referenced the choir at the beginning of my sermon. I wanna talk a moment about the Christian family. And by this, I mean the family that goes by that name. Bob and Karen Christian. 20-year members here at church, Bob was a fixture uh, in our choir for most of those years. And I actually had something occur in my conversations with the family that I have never had occur 
to this degree. And I've done a few of these. But I gathered the family together, three generations. Uh, Karen, sons and daughters, or da sons, and then their grandkids. So there were three generations on the phone call, all by Zoom. And in all my years of ministry, I'd never been in a memorial service preparation conversation with a family for an hour and 15 minutes where most of the conversation was dominated by laughter. Didn't fit. And so when I carefully asked the question, how, how is it that in this time of tremendous loss of a real patriarch of the family, uh, Bob died from complications of Alzheimer's too soon. And how is it that we can be sitting on this phone call and everybody is just enjoying themselves so very much? Well, the answer was consistent and it was cross-generational. When I carefully asked how they could all be laughing, the response was the same. There always was just so much love in Bob and Karen's household. Whoever you were, and whenever you hit their home, you just experienced that. I referenced one. When I came to this church six and a half years ago, came and got a phone call, my wife got a phone call from Karen Christian. I didn't know who the Christians were, I was brand new here. Karen invited Cammie over to her and Bob's house for tea. And she invited several other women from the church over for tea. And her sole purpose was for the sometimes overlooked wife of the new pastor to be seen and to get to know some women in the church. And so Cammy went and just had the best time because as I would later find out, Bob and Karen did hospitality, Southern hospitality, like few others. They held a tea and had just the best time, but what Cammie told me was Bob was there refilling every plate, refilling every cup of tea, and asking, what else can I bring you? This was the way Bob and Karen lived their life. There always was just so much love and hospitality in the house. You just felt it. Bob's quick wit, his laughter, and his deep faith, he learned from his father, and passed it down to his children and his grandchildren. It was a laughter that marked a home with a baptized way of life within the church family, within the context of prayer, within the context of service to others was just how you lived your life. And the kids and the grandkids learned to live their lives that way because that's the way it was gonna be in the Christian household. There was not an alternative. Bob and Karen's obvious love of God, their obvious love for one another, their obvious love for their kids and their grandkids, but also their obvious love for anyone who was brought into the house was simply contagious. Their table was not all that big, but it was always big enough to bring one more chair for one more guest to be taken seriously, to be seen and treated as family. As granddaughter Taylor said, watching them, she got teary and so did I. She said, watching them changed the trajectory of my life and how I live my marriage and how I raise my children. It's a baptized way of living that didn't stop with just the kids and the grandkids. It carried into his profession. Bob was an FBI agent. And I have to kind of do some gymnastics in my mind to think how a person so loving, so tender, so kind could enter into the dark, sometimes very dark profession of law enforcement. So when I ask both Mike and Rob, his sons, who also are FBI agents, how does that happen? They were quick to say, for dad, it was not a job, it was a purpose. It gave life meaning. 
My dad saw people who had no voice. He was determined to give them one. He saw people who had no power. He was determined to empower them. And for him, it was of great pride that he could step into the gap between the powerless and those who would exercise power over them and stand beside them. That is a man who lived into his baptism beyond the event in the sanctuary of a church. He carried grace in the form of advocacy for all persons who did not have the voice to ask for it themselves. They said he was proud and he makes us proud to do what we do on behalf of others. It's a baptized way of life. It's one full of grace and laughter and dedication to others. That has effect on a person. It certainly had effect on his kids and his grandkids. And it has effect on a church. As we baptize, and as we teach all that Jesus commanded, and then go and do likewise. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.